Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. And I am Eki Tepsapornchai. Well, guys, it's good to have you back. We are um, just uh, one week away from Christmas Eve, and uh, this is actually um, a, a, almost a, 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 well, not almost, a providential topic for the season we're in. Uh, yeah. One of our listeners uh, sent in a question, and the question was basically this, how do you talk to unbelievers uh, about Christ? Um, how do you talk to unbelieving children all the way up to, you know, friends or family members, coworkers, et cetera. And um, it's a really great topic. And I think it's a especially, I, I say providential, because uh, during this time of year, more people are faced with um, the person of Christ in some way um, than any other time of the year, right? Unbelievers. Yeah. You, you have nativity scenes all over. You have Christmas songs, um, you know, many of which are hymns. Um, kind of all over. And so there is uh, it, a unique time period in terms of being an unbeliever, right? Where you just sort of, it's all around you in some way, shape or form. Um, so great topic to talk about. How do you get into gospel conversations with unbelievers? Um, and uh, maybe let's just kind of start with children uh, because you know, lots of parents in the church have children who have not yet professed faith in Christ. Um, and so uh, let me just ask you, Eki, and we'll just dive right in here. Let's say a parent comes to you and they say, look, I have a child, um, may, maybe they're six, seven, eight years old. That's probably a large range in development, but, yeah. um, and, and they're, they're not, they're not a Christian. And let's just assume that, um, you know, maybe the parent is just really thinking, about that and and learning that that's what they need to be doing um and they say how how do i start sharing christ with my child how how do i not make this awkward um how how do i make it sensible what where do i start how would you counsel that parent yeah i think children are actually the easiest to talk to in some sense i mean it's there's a special challenge of trying to relay information in a way that they would understand but they're also the simplest because they don't really have their guards up. They're they're not going to get offended by you uh, bringing up Christ or, or asking them, you know, what do they think about life and things like that and sin. Uh, and chances are a lot of these topics such as sin and, uh, and and the idea that Jesus Christ had to die for our sins, that that's going to be completely foreign to a, a child's mind. So I, I think that's a great opportunity to just explain it as simply as possible and just say, you know what, we are all sinners. Do you know what sin is? And, uh, and and start working with the child that way. And when you think about the gospel elements, before you can even get to the good news, you need to help explain what the bad news is. And the bad news revolves around who God is and, and who we are, and especially who we are as sinners and, and the punishment that's deserved because of that. So just in a simple way, just start uh, talking to the child about that. Now, I'm assuming uh, most cases when I have that opportunity to talk to a child uh, about that, the parents are already believers— um, and they're welcoming the opportunity for me to be able to teach Christ to to their kids. And, and so that's that's going to be a, a very, there's not going to be any tension there. There's not going to be any weird awkwardness. Now, if I'm talking to an unbelieving family uh, with a child, um, then I may go about it a little bit differently. Um, I, I, I'll probably want to address the parents first and uh, try to find a way to have that kind of conversation before I start speaking directly to to the kids, because that could be, become a sensitive issue with parents when they start thinking, why are you talking to my child about this? Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you're in a situation where you're either talking to the child and no one else um, that the parents aren't there, maybe you're, you're visiting. Like I, I speak to chapel. I go to a chapel as part of this uh, um, Christian school. And I speak to a number of different kids or may go into classrooms in that kind of setting. You know, you, you've got freedom to really just be open and, and speak about it and not worry about the kind of walls and the kind of uh, the, the kind of, I guess, arguments that will come up. I think the biggest challenge is going to be with kids who are convinced that they know Christ, um, but they may not. Right. And uh, they, they they've been taught that Jesus Christ is this really good man and that you should love him and 
they've been told things like just ask them into your heart and, and stuff like that. So they, they tend to get this kind of watered down version of Christ that makes it very easy for them to accept. Or even if they have received the true gospel, um, they don't yet understand their, the depth of their sins uh, at, at how easy it is to get tempted by the world and to be able to follow the things of the world. Um, so, you know, I think that's going to be the bigger challenge is really with kids who are convinced they already are, they already are Christians to, to really just kind of engage in a little bit of question and answers and, and seeking to help them better understand elements of the gospel. Yeah. It, you know, I, you made a really good point when, when we're talking about children, it's probably best that, you know, it's children of someone in your family or a close friend or it, yeah. it, you know, um, other otherwise, it's it probably is inappropriate unless you're in a chapel kind of setting where that's the expectation, you know, uh, something like that. So I I think yeah. that's that, that's mindful. Um, talk to the parents in, in that case, but um, yeah, when, when you're talking about a child that you know, um, I I would even and and and, and I agree with all of that, and I would say that before all of that, um the the way to prepare yourself to talk to unbelievers whether the children or adults is to make sure you yourself know the gospel very well um and yeah, i would right. even encourage people to sit down and write out the gospel i mean we 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 do this in our uh, in our church membership you know lots of church memberships uh, if they're they're good grace community church has it um you can write out your testimony and it forces people to think about um, you know, who Jesus is and uh, what what he's done in their life. And so, yeah, I would say if that's on your mind, um, yeah, get out a piece of paper and write out the gospel, yeah. write out um, what you would say to someone and then go to scripture and refine it and, and get it in its simplest terms. Um, and And I think taking the care to do that so that in your own mind, you're not kind of yeah. fumbling or grasping for words. Um, that's incredibly helpful. If the reality is, if you don't know, um, you may you may understand what the gospel is, but if you don't know how to communicate it and you don't know your Bible well, right. you're you you're not where you need to be. Right. Um, and that's not to say if uh, if if you don't, because there is this kind of mentality where it says. I'm I'm not prepared for evangelism, and so you have people doing classes after classes after classes, and they never do it. So that's not what we mean. But you just need to have a clear grasp and be able to communicate it well. And so take some time to write it out. Uh, I I think is a good way. There's lots of ways you could prepare. Um, but it, it, and so let's let's talk about unbelieving children. And so you think about like grandparents with grandkids, for instance. I mean, that'd probably be a very common one, right? Um, you're able to talk to the child. There's a personal relationship. Uh, there's really no issues there, or you know, hopefully. Um, but the kid doesn't know. And I think I would say um, having a grasp of where the child is in their mental development is actually something that should be thought about um, because that helps you with the language you need to know. Um, yeah. And it, the kid might be at such an age where, you know, really you're just introducing truth um, at the very fundamental level um, so that maybe you're just introducing them what it means to be bad, um, yeah. you know, and, and it's opposite. And and that God is good, and that we are bad, and you, you know, figure out some way to give examples of, you know, how we're bad and things like that. Um, but I think just knowing the child is is really important. It's going to be different different for every every kid, every parent, uh, every conversation will be different. So you can't really give like a A B C. This is the checklist to do. I think it, it yeah. requires some intentionality. What 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 are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I would think, um, I, I agree with what you said, think in terms of starting points also. I mean, if you're going to, I agree, it's a great exercise to write down the gospel and uh, multiple ways, and there are multiple ways you can prepare the gospel and and think in terms of starting points. So in terms of this season, Christmas, very obvious starting point, right? Um, there's a, a lot of nativity scenes. There's a lot of stories that kids will hear about the wise men who came from the East, 
or the angels that that were singing and all that. Um, the the announcement to Mary that a child is coming and, and he's he's meeting God with us, right? Uh, so uh, think about starting points that a child may have had some exposure to, and uh, and for instance, if we we're going to take the story of the wise men, hey, have you ever heard of the story of the wise men that came to that came to worship baby Jesus? You, you know, a lot of kids may have been exposed to that or show them a picture of the nativity scene and say, hey, do you know what this is? Uh, do you know why those wise men came? You know, so you can take that starting point and try to think, okay, from that starting point, how do I now transition into helping them understand at a very basic level um, why they came, what's the significance of this baby and, and all that? And, you know, for unbelievers, what's the most recognized verse in the Bible? It's John 3.16, right? So I almost always bring that up. I say, you've probably heard this uh, at every sporting event. You see people writing it on their phone or uh, putting it on signs, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that he who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And in fact, I know a lot of kids who are not necessarily believers, but they know that verse. And many parents who have memorized that verse from a kid, even though they haven't really professed Christ. So I've, um, I've come across many people who could actually recite that verse to me. And then I'll take that time to say, hey, have you ever really thought what that means? You know, God so loved the world. Well, why? He, it says He gave His only begotten Son. Why did, why did God express His love by giving His Son? What do you think the, what do you think the the point of that was? And most people who have that verse memorized, actually aren't sure. Um, when I ask them that question, they're like, "Oh, I don't know," um, because Jesus Christ is a really loving person, and He wanted to send Him as an example for us to to show us how to love. And I said, "Well, that's." That's part of it, but I think there's a more important reason than that, because the rest of the verse talks about those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. So, yeah, think about starting points. Uh, and when you're talking to kids, yeah, think about their the level that, that they're at. Um, just try to help introduce them to some basic concepts, anything that they may have been exposed to so that they can start to mentally make connections between what it is that they're used to seeing and, and what it is that that means. And I tell you what, even... Tell you what, even something like Santa Claus, which we don't teach, and I know you don't teach, we talked about that last time. Um, well, Santa Claus came from Saint Nick, right? I mean, that's you know, a lot of kids will know who Santa is a Claus, real his name. Yeah, who is a real person, a yeah. real Christian. So you could use that to say, hey, well, actually, Santa Claus was named after a guy named Saint Nick. And Saint Nick is someone who gave his life to Jesus Christ and in fact was very passionate uh, about people understanding Jesus Christ the right way. Right. So, I mean, you know, little things like that. There's a lot of different starting points. And I remember in seminary, uh, we would have to go through this exercise where the teacher will throw a concept at us. And we've got to find a way to transition from that concept into a discussion about the gospel, about Jesus Christ in, in some way. Or think about any kind of verse in scripture, any section of scripture. Can you go from that verse into showing how it somehow points to Christ? Right. Uh, that's that's an exercise yeah. that we have to go through in terms of preaching and, and being able to proclaim the gospel no matter what passage we're in. So similarly for um, for anyone, any lay person, think in terms of not only know the gospel, but then be creative in terms of how you can transition from some sort of starting point into into helping a person understand who Christ is. Yeah. And, and so I think that just goes back to reiterate the fact that you, you need to know the Bible well. Right. Yeah. Get to know the Bible well, be memorizing verses, be reading scripture regularly. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you, we go from children and again, this is going to be different from person to person. So it's really nearly yeah. impossible to kind of give e examples that would fit, you know, necessarily in any particular person. But so you, you kind of move on from children to uh, uh, adults. Um, and oh, well, let me say this. I, I think we can't also forget the power of prayer um yes you know oftentimes I, I think in our circles um because we tend to be very guarded against anything that seems kind of unbiblically mystical um it, you know but unfortunately sometimes i think we practically lump prayer into a category where it seems like it's not real it's not effective um w which is absolutely not true and so um, I, I would, you know, if someone's on your heart to start uh, witnessing to sharing the gospel or even just in general, you know, be praying and asking that God would bring to mind at the right moments scriptures to use that 
um, he would give you the right words to speak, that it would give you clarity of thought in those moments. And those are the kinds of prayers that 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 were promised God answers. Um, th those are the right kinds of prayers. And so I think being uh, dependent upon prayer is is a vital thing. And I would say that and knowing your Bible are e on equal footing, in fact. Um, so kind of go from there to adults, right? So this is going to be an interesting one. Let, uh, let's let's just use an example and an adult maybe you just are vaguely acquainted with. So maybe they're a coworker you don't know that very that well. Maybe they're the gas station attendant that you see, you know, every week when you fill up. Um, maybe it's the guy that you see walking past you in the park, you know, once a week. There, there's some level of acknowledgement you've seen this person. Um, yeah. How, how, how would you, how would you go about uh, that kind of conversation? Again, you know, it's hard to just. But just fundamentally, what what would you say a person should be thinking through? Yeah, there, there again, there are multiple ways that you can approach this. Uh, but for someone that you might be an acquaintance of, maybe that person recognizes your face, you recognize that person's face, you you say hi um, on occasion and whatnot. Um, a simple question like, "Hey, do you attend a church?" Um, just yeah. I would maybe just start there. Do you attend a church? And and uh, if so, find out. Uh, say, oh, which church do you attend? Or if you don't attend, hey, I would invite you to come. To, um, to our church, have you ever thought about attending? And, you know, it's interesting that a lot of people, to, to that simple question, their guard may not be up immediately. In fact, I, I've i run across a number of people that will say something like, no, but, you know, I really need to start going. I, I haven't, you know, I went to church as a kid, and, you know, and in this day and age, uh, we really need uh, something to believe in, uh, you know, and of course, they're going to say something that theologically is not going to be totally on target. That's to totally to be expected, but you're inviting them to to have a conversation first about church. Or if I'm in a in a conversation with someone where I'm, you know, we're just talking about life in general, um, I'm going to be looking for ways to transition about thinking about life and death or, or the Lord Jesus Christ. I might just ask straight up in the middle of a conversation, hey, let me ask you a question. Um, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? What, what do you think of him? What, what, you know, something like that and, and see what the response is and start working with that response. Now, what you said about prayer is crucial. We should not only be praying for the people in our life, that salvation we brought to them and that we would be used as vessels to be able to bring um, the, the good news of salvation to them, but also in the midst of your conversation, if you're and you're you're having this opportunity to have a conversation with someone, and for guys, sports is an easy topic to get into. You start talking about sports, talk about world events, stuff like that, and then transition to something a little bit deeper. Um, but whatever conversation I'm in, um, I am actively praying to God, God, please open a door, please open a door, please open a door. Give me some opportunity um, to to be able to speak towards spiritual truths or spiritual realities. And and sometimes if it's a person that you know that you're going to see again, um, you know, not not someone that you just met one time and they're forever out of your life, but someone maybe someone who works at the local gas station or something like that, a convenience store, grocery store, or whatever. Um, it, you know, you you could just start by just dropping nuggets uh, of information. You know, you introduce them to church, you ask them about Jesus Christ. Um, you know, I ask them their opinion on life and death. I, I mean, just little things here and there. It doesn't all have to be in one conversation, but over time, just kind of start building up and uh, and and dropping little nuggets of of truth with that person. But if you haven't have a chance to sit down and have coffee with that person, or to have lunch or, or breakfast or, or whatever, and and you have time, you know, look for an opportunity to present the entire gospel. Yeah. Last thing I was talking about dropping nuggets. Um, I mentioned uh, we have um, business cards that we have printed from the church with. The church name, address, service times, you can leave people with that as well. Um, just look for opportunities to get them thinking about spiritual realities. Yeah. Um, yeah, we we also have um cards like that. And and I, I found this from some other church, and so it wasn't my idea. I stole it because it was brilliant. Um, but on the back of our church card is actually a full little gospel presentation. You know, it's yeah, in like good idea. size six font or something, but um, <laughs> yeah. It's there. And uh, so that's a helpful tool, right? Um, and so I, I would say, thinking about that, um, ask your church if uh, if they have some tools um, for that kind of thing. and Or maybe um, what uh, online resources, because you know, pastors should be able to recommend those. 
Yeah. Um, I, I know in our church, we have a little wall where we have a bunch of gospel tracks. And even if you don't use those, I, I would say if you get the good ones um, and just read through them several times to to just give yourself an idea of how a conversation could go. Um, and, and I think to your point, if we had to sort of summarize what you were doing when you're talking about looking for nuggets to drop, I, I think the point is just to be aware enough of what's going on during the encounter that yeah. you're you're intentionally looking for something. So if you're just kind of going about your day and it's haphazard, you know, you you fill up gas, you go in the store and get a cold drink. Um, and you're not really thinking about it and you walk out and you think, oh man, I should have got into a conversation. Well, the, the chances of you getting into one are, is not likely if, if you're not being intentional about it. And so just take a little bit of time to, to think about, to think, to think about that. So, um, yeah. And I, I think you also made a good point. You said something to the effect of, uh, the effect of not giving the full gospel presentation, just giving little nuggets, and I think that probably hinders some people is they think they have to get through the entire gospel yeah. and the person has to respond right there. Well, we, we believe in the sovereignty of God. Um, and so I, I think not to say there's no sense of urgency. And if you have the opportunity, you know, at the gas station yeah, to absolutely. present mm -hmm. a full gospel, then take it. Um, but, you know, if it's busy and, and not um, just little things like, you know, I think you mentioned asking the question, where do you go to church? Um, yeah. And God uses those things, right? Anything you can mention that would cause the person to think about God, in, in even in just the most general of ways, because you can always build on there from that. Um, you know, and then just kind of, you know, I, I think, I don't want to say target that person in a weird way, but, you know, when you go back, just you know, keep in mind, okay, last time, you know, I asked them if they went to church anywhere and, you know, they were kind of like, well, not really. And, um, you know, you're looking for facial cues and things like that. So I do think there's yeah. a, a situational mm -hmm. awareness that is very helpful. Um, we, we, we trust God and he's sovereign in that. And I think that's a big thing is, uh, just get out and start doing it. It's going to feel uncomfortable probably at the beginning because it's not something you're used to doing. Um, and then trust God in the midst yeah. of it. You know, I think about Paul when he talks about the fact that one plants and one waters, but it's God who causes the the growth. Um, and I think our aim is just to be faithful with whatever opportunities we can, as faithful as we can be. And eventually you'll get to where it becomes like second nature. I mean, just look at um, Ray Comfort, right? I mean— yeah. I Ray Comfort, he he probably witnesses to people in his dreams. Um, he, yeah. He's been doing it so long. Um, and maybe that's another thing is watch uh, some known, solidly biblical, faithful men um, who have ministries. And, and I think yeah. watching some of that, you kind of pick up ways to talk to people and, and things like that. Um, yeah, I, we can make it very too difficult, right, is really all I'm trying to say. We want to be aware you know, of the situation and don't make it yeah. too difficult. Yeah, and I would, you know, obviously I mentioned pray while you're speaking, pray for an opportunity, pray for an opening that uh, that you can drop in. And, you know, I'm going to say something that's going to initially sound a little bit shocking, but hear me out. Um, if you have to resort to some sort of, um, uh, you know, as you're looking for opportunities, almost scheming for ways to try to get them to ask questions and open up. And, and let me give you some examples of that. When I was in seminary, I was still working almost full time while going to seminary. I would be at the workplace and the workplace has strict rules about um, you're not allowed to go and approach someone and, and start talking to them about religion and things like that. Um, but if someone happens to ask you a question, you can go ahead and answer it. Right. But you just can't be proactive in, in bringing up your, your faith and your religion. Well, at the workplace, you know, people would ask me, how, how am I doing? I'm saying, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. Things are just really busy between work and school, and I'll just leave it at that. And then they'll kind of look at me and go, school? What, what, what school are you going to? Oh, okay, well, I'm going to seminary. I'm like, seminary? How did that happen? I was like, okay, well, you ask, right? So, so now, yeah. I'm, I'm, in a sense, I'm scheming by putting little nuggets out there that's going to get them to ask questions. And as they're asking questions, 
okay, I'm like, okay, well, you asked the question, so let me go and answer. And eventually it leads to an opportunity to be able to share about my faith. And the last job I had, when I first started that job, I was not saved. And so it was a few years into that, that God saved me. So it's an interesting way to be able to talk about that um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, had another couple um, during the COVID uh, shutdown here in California, there was a number of people that did not want to get the vaccine. And, and this is not a, we're not making a podcast ep episode about the the pros and cons of, uh, of vaccines, but in order for anyone who did not want to get the vaccine, they had to get a religious exemption. And so I had this one couple, the wife uh, had been attending our services online. At that time we were online, but the husband really was not spiritual, not attending any kind of church, not interested in any, anything like that. But uh, anyway, he wanted a religious exemption and he knew that his wife was kind of uh, attending our church virtually. And so she reached out to me and asked, hey, would you be willing to write a religious exemption for my husband? And, uh, and I told her, I said, I'll do it under one condition. She said, what's that? I said, when you watch the church services, he needs to watch them with you. And uh, she goes, okay, deal. So I wrote the religious exemption. Um, he started watching. And then within about a year, a year and a half, they both came in for counseling. And uh, he's now put his faith into Christ. Uh, we're working on him getting baptized. He attends our men's discipleship groups. But I mean, little things like that, where even that example of, okay, I'll help him. It's a little bit of a quid pro quo, quo, but I think it's a sanctified quid pro quo, right? I do something for you, yeah. and in exchange, you do this. So I'm, I'm just trying to get him exposed to biblical preaching, you know, what it is his wife is listening to, and, and get him used to seeing me so that when he comes in and eventually came in for counseling with he and his wife, um, it's not completely foreign to him. And I was able to share the gospel, and, and by the grace of God, he put his faith into Christ. But so when I say scheming, just looking for opportunities to just throw things out there that will get them curious, ask him questions, um, or, hey, you know, if um, if someone's asking you to do them a favor, say, hey, you know what, I'll do this, but I tell you what, what are you doing on Sunday? Why don't you come with me to church, right? Yeah. And and we've uh, there's people at our, our church that uh, someone else brought them on that kind of deal, and they didn't want to come to church. They ended up coming, and they ended up giving their life to Christ. So, you know, d scheming usually is not a good word because it's usually used for deceptive purposes, for bad ends. But in this case, if you're looking for an opportunity just to get them before God, I say do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's really just planning, right? Um, and it, yeah, and that's really good. And I think just thinking of little ways that you can— uh, get people to ask you questions, as you said, is actually really perfect. And another thing I would say uh, and um, would be find ways to, at least in the beginning, to start a conversation by sharing what God's done in your own life. Now, we need yeah. to understand that our personal testimony is not the gospel. It is a result of the gospel. Um, but we should, we could and should absolutely use it. Um, it, you know, if that's the the icebreaker, if that's the way to, um, it, you know, get people into a conversation, then then absolutely, we just need to make sure we understand that is not the gospel, right? Um, but it's it's legitimate uh, because it it's a very real thing for people to see the work of God in someone else's life. It is a testament um, yeah. to to. God's existence to who he is to what he does um and and then that would lead me to my next point is that also I think just making sure that we're living a faithful Christian life um it, you know helps in these conversations especially with people who maybe you don't know but they see you you know uh, occasionally the the gas station worker or the grocery store person um it, you know I hmm, yeah, I think it's a good idea if you regularly go to a particular uh, grocery store is to find one cashier um, and always try to go to that cashier. Um, and that way, little by little, you're getting just a few minutes to have some kind of conversation. Yeah. And, you know, maybe you get to drop little nuggets about, hey, where do you go to church or do you go to church or, hey, come visit our church or Maybe over a time period, you know, if it's always very busy and you don't really get that interaction, you get just enough that they see somehow you're a little different. Now, this is not that idiotic statement, share the gospel without words. That's stupid. Yeah. Um, but but there should be some element of 
um, difference in, in our life. Like people should, yeah. you know, over time start to see that, you know what, I, I never hear any foul words from this person. I, I never mm-hmm. hear it. I never see any of this, like, and maybe they don't consciously think of any of that, but just, you just seem different than what they're, they're accustomed to in the world. And that helps with conversations. I think it's just the combination of kind of all these things. Um, you you got to be a person of prayer, number one. Uh, you've got to know the Bible. You need to know the gospel. Um, if you only have a few minutes to share, you, you want to make sure you can you you could do that. Um, and I would I would encourage people to write their testimony down too, right? Um, you yeah. write your and and you know the first time you do it, and you probably had this experience. The first time you write down your testimony, uh, I mean, you're thinking of all kinds of things, every conversation, um, and you sort of whittle it down a little bit. And uh, if, if you were baptized at Grace, I know they help help you know with this kind yeah. of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the point to writing your own testimony down, similar to writing down the gospel, is so that it's kind of clear and concise and you can give little bits of it w- yeah. when the situation calls for it you know, without confusing people with a lot of, you know, extra words, uh, unnecessary. Background. Yeah. And, 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 and I would add in terms of the testimony, you're right. The testimony is not the gospel, um, but uh, a well-written or well thought of testimony will include clear gospel elements. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So I, I know for myself, I was saved uh, in 2007 while I was attending Grace Community Church, taking the fundamentals of the faith class and uh, I could talk about the fact how I was listening to a message from John MacArthur on the topic of holiness. It was the holiness of God that really convicted my heart, that made me understand that Christians are to be different because God is different, and uh, and, and that gap that exists between us, right? And me coming to an understanding of how much I needed the Lord because of my sinful nature, right? So, I mean, part of your testimony, as as you are, you are describing how you came to Christ— um, Describe exactly as much you can as well, not just what was happening externally. I went to this place, I heard this, this person helped me, and this and that. But describe what was going on in your heart, that you started to understand things that you didn't understand before, right? Uh, That uh, Jesus Christ, whom you didn't care about before, you started to recognize that, wow, this really is the Son of God, right? So, I mean, obviously, I I don't want to put words into anyone's mouth, but think through exactly what was going on in terms of your understanding of the gospel and start to weave that in as well. So even if they only hear your gospel, they actually do hear, I mean, if they only hear your testimony, they do hear elements of the gospel weaved in there as well, so that when you then transition into the gospel, it's actually not going to be the very first time they heard it, but it's going to be something extracted out of your testimony that that now gets kind of more fleshed out and and um, and exposited, if you will, expanded yeah. uh, for for them to understand. You know, maybe it'd be helpful if just both of us share our testimonies, uh, just just yeah. in in brief. So, wh- what's your testimony? How did you come to know the Lord? Yeah, you know, for me, and I, I would go back to my college days, back in the early 1990s. I actually made a profession of Christ. Um, I had a very basic understanding of the gospel. Um, I put my faith into Christ, saying that I believe the gospel, I believe Jesus Christ. And from that point, I believed I was a Christian. Now, for, I would say, the vast majority of people, maybe even Christians, upon hearing that, they would say, yeah, that's when you were saved. Um, The problem was that from that time in the early 1990s all the way until 2005, 2006, there really was no fruit in my life. There was no desire to read the Bible, no desire to be in prayer, no desire to be with the church. Um, no desire to to really understand God's will, just this kind of comfort that I gave myself that, yeah, because I confessed Christ and I believe the gospel, I'm going to be saved. But during that time, I not only did not interest myself in the things of God, but I basically lived my life the way I wanted to live. I lived it like the world. Um, I did things that were absolutely sinful, um, but I, I did it with the deception that, well, if I do this with a good heart and God knows my heart and this and that, um, there's not a problem here, Right. And so at some point in 2005, I would say there were some major events that hit my life that made me realize, you know, I call myself a Christian, but I need to start going to church to to understand what that means. Now, at no point did I think that I was not a Christian. I still thought I was a Christian, but I started going to church and I was attending, um, I was attending seeker sensitive churches. Okay. I knew about Grace Church because I'd been exposed to them from college. I knew how 
great of a Bible scholar John MacArthur was. He has always left a very deep impression with me as someone who really knew the Bible. But I also know that he was kind of in your face about what he believed, right? And also, I wasn't too crazy about the hymns and, and the singing, so I wanted to go to a contemporary church where things were a little bit more, you know, the, the songs are easier to sing, I, I'm going to enjoy them more, maybe there's more of a conversation from the pulpit, not not someone just preaching the truth at you. And uh, and so I started going to seeker-sensitive churches. I did that for several weeks until realizing, you know what, I really don't know any more about God now than I did when I first started this, or God's Word. So at that point, remembering Grace Community Church from my college days, I thought, okay, I need to go back there and start listening to John MacArthur again. And I actually wanted to get baptized. I came to Grace Church, wanted to go through the baptism process, um, really just make it all official. And the elders wisely told me, um, well, we recommend um, that you would uh, attend the Fundamentals of the Faith class if you haven't done that already. So Fundamentals of the Faith, 13 lessons um, spanning over several months, met with a small group of about 10 to 15 people, and slowly started just working through the fundamental doctrines of Christian faith. And it was lesson three that I first remember conviction starting to come in my heart. Lesson three was about the attributes of God. And I was listening to a message from John MacArthur, and he was describing the holiness of God. And it was that point I became convicted of God's holiness. Um, but then it wasn't until later, as I'm starting to grow more and more, understanding more and more, that I think at the end of 2006, going into 2007, New Year's is about to hit. I'm thinking through New Year's resolutions. Nothing sticks. And uh, at some point, I thought, you know what? Um, and I believe it was the Holy Spirit that put this thought into my heart that, I want to serve God. And mm -hmm. that um, desire stuck. And, uh, and and from that point in time, my my growth just took a trajectory that I'd never seen before. And, and really, when it came to the Bible, um, understanding the Bible, there was an understanding of the Bible that really started to blossom. It was like the analogy I give is sitting in a dark room and having sat in that dark room for decades, suddenly a bunch of lights turning on, and now I can mm -hmm. see. And so yeah. the Bible started to make a whole lot more sense to me. I was starting to make connections before that I couldn't make um, prior to that. And so even without coming to an understanding that I was not a believer, that I was deceived, which I know I was, um, even then, God still regenerated my heart to understand who Jesus Christ is, why I needed him, um, the Word of God as really our only reliable source uh, of life and godliness— and from that point forward, uh, God just uh, just really continued to shine His face upon me and, and grow me through His Spirit, grow me through knowledge, and uh, and yeah, and less than two years after that, I was teaching fundamentals of the faith, and then shortly after that, I started seminary. So yeah, yeah. So so are you saying you you thought you were saved, and somewhere in that process, you actually got saved? Yeah, and that's grace upon yeah. grace, because because yeah. really, I, I would mm. say that we need to be a, we need to come to a conviction of our sinfulness. We need to come to a conviction yeah. of our need for Christ. And having believed I was a believer, even though I wasn't, um, was was interesting because at no point did I thought think, wow, I'm not a believer. But rather, God, just out of his grace, started regenerating my heart uh, during that process as I was learning more and more. And suddenly I was awakened to the truth. And uh, it wasn't yeah. until theologically I started to understand more of the Bible understand theologically about regeneration and and the the heart change that comes from the spirit that I was able to look back and think wow I actually was not saved God actually no. saved mm -hmm. me and then I I could I could point to various moments where my heart was starting to become awakened to the truth yeah. and then the real fruit came when I you know during that new year's time where I had resolved yeah. to to serve God wow well oh, praise God yeah um you know, my testimony, I grew up in the South. And I think uh, when you grow up in the South, everyone thinks you're a Christian. And uh, so I don't I don't recall ever hearing the gospel until uh, the end of my uh, senior year in high school. And somewhere between um, my senior year in high school and my freshman year in college um, gets a little fuzzy, the exact time frame. But, um, you know, I, there was one of those quid pro quo things for me, actually. Yeah. Um, there, there was this guy who, you know, he just kept bothering me about inviting me to church. And, uh, I heard the gospel the first time, you know, at that age. And I, I was, you know, big into science. That's, I was going to major in, in a, in, in an area in college, you know, veterinary medicine. 
And uh, so I was, I didn't need God. I had science, you know, let's, I don't have time for that made up nonsense. But anyway, so this guy basically just kept bugging me about going to church. And I did have a relationship with him. Um, you know, he was a friend and um, probably a, a new, fairly new friend. But um, eventually I just said, listen, I will go with you one time. Don't ever ask me again. Um, and so he was quite happy about that. And, you know, so I went to this meeting and this 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 church evangelistic thing. And, you know, I sat there and I listened to the preacher preach and think, you know, knowing what I know now, looking back, there were all kinds of things that were wrong. But um, but the, the the gospel presentation was true and was was accurate. And I remember sitting there for the first time in my life thinking, I am actually a very wicked person. Um, and, you know, up to that point, I never really got in trouble in school. I didn't do drugs. I didn't, you know, I, I was by all, you know, hum normal secular standards, a, a really good kid. And so I, I just remember sitting there and, you know, I'm not an overly emotional person typically and tears just start, you know, streaming down my face. And I just realized that I need a savior. And so uh, now they did an altar call. I'm not personally a big fan of those for various reasons, but you know, God used it. Um, and so I went down and responded in faith. And, you know, for me, that was a genuine conversion. Um, and it came about, you know, God used this guy who just wouldn't stop. And he he wasn't uh, belligerent. He wasn't combative. Um, you know, it was but just was every persistent. few times. Yeah, he was persistent every few times, right? Um, hey, why don't you come to church? Uh, why don't you come to church? And then eventually I just, I couldn't get rid of him uh, because we were in the same classes in college together. And so I was going to keep seeing this guy. And so I made the deal and, um, and, and then God regenerated my heart uh, during that. And so, um, yeah. And then from there, I... I mean, instantly just had a love and affection for the things of God. And he changed, you know, the way I thought about things, the way I felt about things. Um, I, I mean, just, you know, things I didn't even consider. And, you know, probably the first time in, in my life experienced just some true joy. And so, yeah. And so that's that's basically my short testimony. And so I, I think as we were talking about how you evangelize other people, um, your testimony, you know, it's not the gospel, but it contains the gospel if you communicate it well. Um, yeah. and you don't have to do it perfectly. You don't have to give every detail. Just start yeah. with what you can. I think, um, you know, if you're diligent in, um, you know, go to the scriptures, find the passages that talk about the gospel. And when we say the gospel, I, I think we should be clear. What we don't mean is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. No. You know, the kind of Joel Osteen nonsense. Um, that that's not what I mean. The the gospel literally just is good news. Um, but it requires a communicating that whole package, right? W why is there a need for the good news? Um, you know, and so you start with the fact that uh, man is at some stage, you know, people who come to Christ need to know that they're a sinner. And they need to understand that because of that sin, there's a penalty that's deserved, right? Not just that they're going to get, but actually they deserve it um, because they've fallen short of perfection, of being righteous, of being good, of being holy. Um, you know. And then the good news then is that God sent his son Christ to die mm -hmm. on the cross um, to become, take on – the sin of yeah. those who would repent and and believe in him. And he becomes sin who knew no sin, you know the verse, and his righteousness is attributed to us. So he's our propitiation. Yeah. Um, and so we, that's the gospel. But if you communicate your testimony in a way where, um, it, you know, think about the moment you realize that, you know, I am a sinner and I need a savior. And if you're communicating that part of your story, then you're communicating the the true gospel. No, and right. you know what's what I do love about sharing, witnessing, using your testimony is that it's very 
it's naturally less offensive. Now, yeah. I don't think we need to worry about whether the gospel is offensive or not. Um, the cross is offensive to those who hate God. So that, you know, we're not worried about that. But if if you are able to prevent walls from being raised, I think it's wisdom to do that. Um, and one way to do that is just sharing your own testimony because someone doesn't feel attacked. They can't argue no. it because it's mm -hmm. your experience and what God's done in your life. And oftentimes God uses it to invite questions in the person, right? No. They go home, they think about it. They think, oh, well, I mean, I've never really experienced true joy. You know, and then the next time you meet that person, maybe they have a question, you know, and if you're looking for those little nuggets, you just keep dragging them along. You never know what God's going to do. But I think what we what we do know for sure is the promise that God's word never returns void. Whatever it is God wants to accomplish, if we're faithful to give the word of God and if if we're getting to the gospel, we're going to get to the word of God, then God guarantees that that's going to accomplish whatever his purposes is for that. Yeah. And as you're sharing, um, you're sharing your testimony, you're sharing the gospel. I'm thinking of first Peter three 15, uh, which says sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. And, and how do you do that? Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and reverence. So obviously, those last two uh, two descriptions, their gentleness and reverence, should always describe how we go about sharing the gospel. But also in that same verse, it says to be prepared to give an account for the hope that is in you, and and that that presumes that people see hope in you, right? They see joy. They they see someone who is not controlled by circumstances, but has some sort of otherworldly joy that cannot be totally understood on just basic, from basic human reasoning, right? So you want to make sure that your characteristics, your walk, we've talked about this, make sure you're walking. But also, you know what, if you're if you're finding yourself bitter, if you're finding yourself feeling down, depressed, and angry at the world, um, I think it's time to do some, just, just some heart examination and to remind yourself of the glories of the gospel. Because when you are upset at life, when you are bitter, there's this verse... No one's going to ask you to give an account for the hope that is in you because they don't see it, right? Yeah. So they, they need to be able to see you living living life with a spiritual contentment that uh, that surpasses all understanding, that is not based on circumstances. They need to be able to see a hope in you. And sometimes the the best time for people to see that hope is actually when you're going through trials. Um, people don't expect to see hope in a person that's going through trials. Yeah. But if you're showing hope when everything's going well, well, I mean, that's everyone feels hopeful when things are going well, right? It's when when trials are are are, um, are around you and you're going through difficult times, uh, you know. And I can name off a, a number of stories of people that were suffering with um, with, with terminal cancer, um, going through a, a loss of loved ones, and, and yet through their testimony, they they show very clearly that they understand the eternal perspective. And verse 16 goes on to say, keep a good conscience so that even in the things that you are slandered, those who revile your good works, your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. So even if people tease you, they mock you, they make fun of you, make sure they're mocking things that actually, well, it actually brings glory to God, right? Um, someone who yeah. believes God, no matter what they say about evolution or science, what they think might disprove God, which doesn't. Um, you know, the fact that you believe that the world is created in six literal days and they think that's foolishness, well, they can mock you all you want, but really it glorifies God that you have shown yourself to actually believe what the Bible says. Um, just giving some simple examples, but you just you just want to make sure that the people you come in contact with see you as someone who is content, that you're not bitter, you're not angry, you're not easily yeah. upset, you don't get into fights, you're not combative, you know, you don't have this reputation for, you know— um, mouthing mouthing at people or you know cursing or anything like that but that you know you kind of mentioned it you know someone's going to look at you and you, they want you want them to think you know what there there's something really pleasant really kind about this person and it gives yeah. credibility yeah. yeah you know i think of joshua 1 8 um it, there's there's a principle here so not to take the passage out of context but it says this book of the law shall not 
depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your ways prosperous and you will have good success. And the, the principle that's applicable here for all believers is what the word in one produces. And, and that's ultimately that that the soul prospers, right? No. The the things that you do um, consistent with the will of God prospers. This isn't your business deal prospers necessarily, or you get the fancy car you want. Um, but, and that would include evangelism, right? It yeah. is in God's will that we share the gospel or that we proclaim, maybe even a better way to say that, that we proclaim the gospel to those around us. And if we're in the word, we're memorizing the word, and we're praying and asking God to help us do that. Um, then, then we will find those conversations start coming more easily. Um, mm -hmm. And we're not concerned about whether or not we see uh, instant fruit in the person. That's up to God. Um, yeah. But, but you'll find in yourself. Not only will you find those conversations uh, easier over time. But I think you'll find that you, God actually uses that to grow you spiritually, um, yes, to put absolutely. your, to grow your faith and confidence in him, to make you more holy, to sanctify you. Um, and, and so vital for us. Um, well, we've gone long enough in this one, and I hope that's helpful for our listeners. You know, we've talked about the need to evangelize before. Um, this is a good conversation, just a help people start thinking about, okay, well, how do I do that? Um, you know, and there's tons of materials and good things out there. Talk to your pastors, talk to your churches, um, listen to the podcast again. But mostly what you need is to know the word, to know the gospel, to be a person of prayer, and then to just go start, just go do it, you know, um, and, and get over the, the, the fear of that, knowing that the, the message that you have is, is the message that makes the difference between eternal life and, and eternal death. God has to bring the effect, um, but you have the message that everyone in the world desperately needs, whether they know it or not, believe it or not, want it or not. Um, and so I hope that's helpful. Um, We'll remind you that uh, we have a YouTube channel, uh, so we'd love for you to subscribe to that uh, as well as our podcast. If you're not subscribed, you can find this if you're, you know, wherever you're seeing this podcast, uh, you can find it on all the platforms, Apple and Android and whatever else is out there. I'm starting to get old, so I'm losing touch with what all the new platforms are. But uh, anyway, we hope that this has been helpful for you. And if you would like to hear us cover a topic, send us an email. Uh, this topic was um, by one of our listeners, and so uh, we'd love to cover topics that are on your heart and on your mind that would be helpful to you. You can send us an email. That would be in the show notes. And until next time, let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.